Good afternoon and welcome to the ELEX webinar on FRBR, aka FERBER, as a foundation for RDA. I'm Kristen Martin, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee. Today our presenter is Robert L. Maxwell. Bob is one of the foremost authorities in the cataloging field and is the senior librarian and chair of the Special Collections and Format Catalog Department at the Harold B. Lee Library at Brigham Young University. His most recent book, Ferber, A Guide for the Perplexed, was published in 2008. He has chaired the RBMS Bibliographic Standards Committee of ACRL and has served on the Committee on Cataloging, Description, and Access of ELEX. He is the author of the Highsmith Award-winning Maxwell's Guide to Authority Work and Maxwell's Guide to AACR2. He holds an MLS from the University of Arizona and a JD and an MA from Brigham Young University, and finally a PhD in Classical Languages and Literature from the University of Toronto. If you have questions for Bob that you think of during this webinar, please type them into the question box on your screen, and Bob will do his best to answer them at the conclusion of the presentation. Also, please note the session will be recorded, and you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the webinar with a link to the recording. You will also receive a copy of Bob's slides. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Bob, and there may be a slight delay. Um, are we here now? Uh, thank you, Kristen, and thank you for coming to the webinar, where we will discuss Ferber as a foundation for RDA and library databases. During the 1990s, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, commissioned a new look at the bibliographic universe. The result was the document, Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records, or FERBER, published in 1998. FERBER was joined by a companion volume, Functional Requirements for Authority Data, or FRAD, published last year in 2009. FRAD is an expansion of FERBER and adds a number of entities not found in FERBER. There is also an ex extension of FERBER called Functional Requirements for Subject Authority Data, still under development. This presentation will be based on both FERBER and FRAD, but I will refer to the model as a whole as FERBER. FERBER analyzes the bibliographic universe and divides it into a set of entities, such as persons, corporate bodies, concepts, works, and so forth. Ferber is not a cataloging code. It is a conceptual model of the bibliographic universe based on a database modeling technique called the Entity Relationship Model, first introduced in the 1970s. This model is widely used in database design, but until recently hasn't been used extensively in library databases. In this model, a specific database universe is defined, and this universe is divided into specific entities linked by specific relationships. An entity is something that can be distinctly identified within the context of the database. For example, a business database might define as entities customers, employees, managers, stores, suppliers, and so forth. A genealogical database might define as entities persons, places, and events. A relationship is an association between two or more entities. A business database might define a relationship between a particular store and an employee. A genealogical database might define a father-child relationship between a male person and his children. In the model, entities and relationships are defined by attributes. An attribute is a characteristic that may identify instances of entities or relationships. For example, one of the attributes of a person is his or her birth date. Other possible attributes for a person might be where he lives, his profession, his marital status, and so forth. Entity relationship databases are designed with the, the, um, the, <coughs> with the entities, relationships, and attributes needed for the purpose of the database. A personnel database might need to define lots of attributes and relationships for persons. For example, social security number, sex, marital status, position in the company, or salary. A bibliographic database would not define all possible attributes and relationships for person. 
just those needed for the purposes of the database, such as name, possibly birth and death dates, relationship to works he or she has created, and so forth. RDA, based on Ferber, defines entities, relationships, and attributes. Most of our cataloging under RDA will consist of describing the attributes of the different Ferber entities. There are a number of different conventions of diagramming the entity relationship model. One of the most basic methods is to use a rectangle for an entity, a diamond for a relationship, and an oval for an attribute. I have found this model to be the most convenient for describing an actual database, and so I will be using this diagramming technique during most of this presentation. Ferber's diagramming model is a little different. I will show Ferber diagramming in a moment. In this method of diagramming, entities, relationships, and attributes are linked by lines. The simplest version uses single lines as shown here. To illustrate more complex situations, other types of lines may be used, including lines with arrows at either end to show whether the relationship is reciprocal or not. In this presentation, most of the diagrams will have the simple lines shown here. In the basic model, both entities and relationships can have attributes, but in Ferber, attributes have, been only, have only been defined for entities, so no attributes for relationships will be shown in this presentation. Ferber has two diagramming techniques, one for entity relationship sets, that is the abstract model, and another for specific instances, instances of entity relationship. This slide illustrates the entity relationship set diagramming technique. Entities are shown in rectangles, as in the classic model, but relationships are simply shown by words next to the lines. In this illustration, work, expression, manifestation, and item are entities. Is realized through, is embodied in, and is exemplified by our relationships. Single arrows mean that only one instance of an entity can occur in the relationship. Double arrows mean that more than one instance can occur. For example, look at the relationship between item and manifestation. In the Ferber model, a manifestation can be related to more than one item, but an item can be related only to one manifestation. So that's what the double arrow and the single arrow means. This slide illustrates Ferber's diagramming technique when it wants to show specific instances of an entity. In this illustration, the corporate body entity Kelmscott Press has a specific relationship, that of producer, to three manifestation entities, Poems by the Way, The Recoy of the Histories of Troy, and The Works of Geoffrey Chaucer. I have illustrated the two Ferber diagramming techniques here in order to help you understand Ferber itself when you have a look at it. However, as mentioned, I find the traditional entity relationship diagramming technique to be a bit clearer in a graphic presentation, and so I will be using it in the rest of this presentation. To create a good entity relationship database, careful planning is required. When you begin to design an entity relationship database, one of the first things you need to do is define the entities and the relationships. You need to define every entity and every relationship that is important to your particular database. On the other hand, one type of entity should not overlap with another. This careful planning process is exactly what the authors of Ferber, FRAD, and the subject um, FRSAD have done, and it has taken years. The authors of Ferber thought about what types of things should be defined as entities in our bibliographic universe, and this is the result. The entities in the Ferber model are divided into three groups. The first is defined as the product of intellectual or artistic endeavor, and the entities in this group are listed on this slide. Work is a distinct intellectual or artistic creation. Expression is an intellectual or artistic realization of a work in the form of alphanumeric, musical, or choreographic notation, sound, or image, and so forth. Manifestation is the physical embodiment of an expression of a work. Item is a single instance of a manifestation, in other words, a copy. Now to make this a little clearer, let's look at some specific examples of these abstract entities. All of these entities have attributes. Attributes are the characteristics 
that would be necessary to describe each entity to distinguish it from one from other entities of the same type. So the first entity is work. What sort of things distinguish one work from other works? Well, a title, in this case Gone with the Wind. Form, it's a novel. Date of composition, before 1936, and so forth. Some attributes of musical work includes key, include key and medium of performance. The expression entity um, has attributes, and some of the things that um, are defined as attributes of expression include form. This is not literary form, it's more of the physical form. For example, text on paper, cassette, or compact disc, or electronic. Date is another attribute. In the case of the German translation, the this was um, the date it was composed. Language is an attribute of an expression. The first expression shown here it was an English language expression. There may be other English expressions besides this one. The language of the German translation is German, of course. Extent is another attribute. That could be the number of words or the duration of a recording. The manifestation entity, some of the things that distinguish it from other manifestations are its attributes, including its title, and in this case that means exactly what was printed on the title page for a book, statement of responsibility, edition designation, place of publication, publisher, date of publication, and so forth. You can think of the things that might distinguish one manifestation from another. At the item level, some of the attributes are the item identifier. As you can see on the slide here, um, we have barcode numbers. Um, possibly a call number might be um, a, an item identifier. Provenance is one of the attributes who has owned the item. Marks or inscriptions. Condition, for example, one of the copies may be missing its cover. Access restrictions, perhaps one of them is only available in special collections. And location of the item. Now, note that much of RDA consists of instructions for naming and describing the attributes of the entities. It looks to a situation where we might have a separate record or description for each entity, and so it tells us what we should include in the descriptions of those entities. That is, we will need to enter the attributes of the entities into our records in RDA. This is how the primary entities are related to each other. So we can see a work is realized or made real through an expression. An expression is embodied in a manifestation. A manifestation is exemplified by an item. To get more concrete, here are some specific instances of the Ferber work entity with various types of relationships. In this slide, the novel is shown to have a relationship to two other works, a derivative relationship with the movie, and a descriptive relationship with the work Vanity Fair and Gone with the Wind, a critical comparison. In a real database, the work Gone with the Wind, that is the novel, would have relationships with many other works, and it would also potentially have relationships with instances of all the other types of Ferber entities. The database becomes like a web with dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of relationship links between any one entity and other entities. In this slide, you can see further relationships between the movie and a work that describes it, Gone with the Wind on film, a complete reference, and the work Vanity Fair, and the, uh, and the work which also describes Gone with the Wind. So you can see that that work, Vanity, the work Vanity Fair and Gone with the Wind, a critical comparison, is linked to two different works. Gone with the Wind and Vanity Fair. In a Ferber RDA-based database, each of these work entities would have separate descriptions that the user could examine. The second group of entities are those responsible for creating intellectual or artistic content in Group 1 entities. Ferber and Frad have defined three, and these are person, family, and corporate body. Note that family is new to descriptive cataloging rules and was added to the Ferber model through FRAD. RDA incorporates guidelines for ins in describing instances of the family entity. This should be helpful to us as we move forward. The three entities are defined much as we would expect. 
A person is an individual or persona established or adopted by an individual or group. A family is two or more persons related by birth, marriage, adoption, or similar legal status, or who otherwise present themselves as a family. And a corporate body is an organization or group of individuals and or organizations acting as a unit. So here are some concrete examples of these abstract entities. Attributes have been defined for each of the entities. So for person, these include name, dates, title, other designation, gender, place of birth, place of residence, language of person, field of activity. For example, Margaret Mitchell has a name, and she has a gender and dates and so on, and so do Claude Debussy and George W. Bush. The fact that the attributes of each of these are different is what distinguishes them from one another. For corporate body, attributes include name, number, for example, for a meeting, place associated with the corporate body, date associated with the corporate body, type of corporate body, language of the corporate body, its field of activity. For family, attributes include name, type of family, for example, a clan or a dynasty, dates of family, places associated with the family, history of the family. The RDA chapters dealing with these entities tell us how to record the attributes of the entities. Again, RDA is looking toward a database structure where we would have a separate entity record or description for each person, corporate body, or family. And within the entity record, we would describe the entity, or in other words, record its attributes. We would create such a record only once for each entity, rather than our current practice in MARC of repeating much information every time we create a new bibliographic record. Entity records would be linked to other Ferber entity records. For example, the entity record for Margaret Mitchell would be linked to the work record for Gone with the Wind via a creator relationship link. Any entity record can be linked to any other entity record as appropriate. Here we have various relationships between entities. Margaret Mitchell has a creator relationship with the work Gone with the Wind. The work has a realized through relationship with two expressions the English and the German expression. Notice the expression entities also have a relationship to each other because the German expression was actually translated from the first English expression. Finally, the German expression has a translated by relationship with another person entity, Martin Beheim Schwarzbach. Group three entities are entities that can be subjects of works, expressions, manifestations, or items. Any of the entities can be a subject of a work. For example, a person entity from group two could be the subject of a biography. The new group entities in group three are concept, defined as an abstract notion or idea, object, defined as a material thing, event, an action or occurrence, and place, defined as a location. Here are some concrete examples of Group 3 entities. All the examples are Library of Congress subject headings or currently form name access points. Attributes of concept include term of concept and type of concept, so we have Stone Age or French language. Attributes of object include type of object, data production, physical medium, place of production, and so forth. Attributes of event include date associated with the event, place associated with the event. Here we have two events, the eruption of Vesuvius and the Olympic Games in Beijing. Attributes of place include the term for the place. The RDA guidelines for recording attributes of concepts and ob objects are not yet written and do not appear with the first publication. Guidelines for recording attributes of events and jurisdictional places are in the current publication. Here are a few Group 3 relationships to the work Gone with the Wind. In order to keep on familiar ground, I've used LCSH style subject strings. However, note that with current Library of Congress subject heading practice, there is a mixture of Ferber entities when a subject string is subdivided. For example, Georgia is a Ferber place entity. History and fiction are concept entities, and Civil War is an event entity. When combined as a, as a string, the whole thing would probably be regarded, re, re, regarded as a concept. 
If the strings were broken up in, or faceted, it would be possible to be more precise about the entity. This needs thinking out. Another point to note, to note is, in RDA, fictitious characters are grouped with the person entity, not the concept entity. So, Scarlett O'Hara is here on this slide labeled a person. We can also see, um, I just point out that um, the two concepts, war stories and historical fiction, are concepts, but they have a relationship with the work. The, their relationship is a genre relationship. I'm just pointing this out because this has been come up uh, recently on the RDA list, what to do with genres and forms. Ferber, de far, sorry. Ferber defines a set of attributes for each entity in the model. Because it is not a cataloging code, Ferber does not define how the int information is to be recorded. For example, name of person is one of the attributes of the person entity in Ferber. Ferber defines this attribute as the name of a person is the word, character, or group of words and or characters by which a person is known, and points out that a person may be known by more than one name, and that libraries normally select one of the names as a uniform heading. But Ferber does not tell us how to form the data to be recorded in this element, and if we are one of the libraries that wants to select one as a uniform heading, it does not tell us how to make that choice. That is the province of a cataloging code, such as RDA. RDA also defines attributes for entities, but because it is a cataloging code, it also informs us how to record the data, and in the case of the name of person attribute, it tells us how to choose between competing forms. For this webinar, I will take one Ferber entity, person, and demonstrate how this works out in RDA. Ferber and FRAD define several attributes of person. These are mostly taken directly into RDA, where they are worked out more fully, and in some cases refined with sub-elements. In RDA, the act of recording attributes of an entity is re referred to as identifying, so RDA Chapter 9 is called Identifying Persons. Chapter 9 exists within a larger RDA section called Recording Attributes. Within each entity chapter, the guidelines begin with a scope note and general guidelines defining the entity, as you can see here in 9.0 and 9.1. The central portion of each chapter consists of subsections detailing each attribute of the entity, including a def definition of the attribute, also referred to as an element in RDA, and guidelines for recording the information. Finally, at the very end of each chapter is a subsection detailing how to construct an access point to represent the entity, here in 9.19. It is extremely important that you understand this structure or you will get confused. The central subsections of the chapter do not necessarily have anything to do with the access point. They are intended to give guidance for recording attributes, not for constructing an access point. How might this work out in the real world? Margaret Mitchell is an instance of the person entity. Many of the RDA-defined attributes apply to her. How would we work RDA out, RDA out in a Ferber-based database? The first RDA attribute is name of person. RDA works this out into two sub-elements, preferred name and variant name. RDA instructs us, for all of these forms, to invert and it instructs us to choose the commonly known form as the preferred name. In this demonstration, I will record the preferred name in one variant name. The preferred name is based on usage. Variant names can come from any source. Regarding the form Mrs. John Robert Marsh, in RDA, as in AACR2, if a married person is identified only by a partner's name, the term of address is considered an integral part of the name and hence is recorded as part of the name attribute as here. In RDA, a fuller form of name is not required to fill out elements already found in a preferred or variant name. But because Mitchell had a middle name, the fuller form of her forename is Margaret Munnerlin. Date associated with the person is an element which RDA has subdivided into sub-elements, date of birth, date of death, and period of activity. Note the RDA element only calls for the year to be recorded in most cases. I am giving the RDA format 
the format that RDA prescribes if two persons with the same name are born or died in the same year. We will see that this data is record, recorded slightly differently in MARC. The attribute gender in RDA can be recorded either male, female, or unknown. If none of these terms is appropriate, another may be provided by the cataloger. Place and birth, place of birth and language of the person are other possible attributes to record. RDA prescribes the forms shown. There are many other elements and sub-elements called for in RDA. Note that only a few are core or required. Preferred name and dates are core. Remember this doesn't mean that the dates necessarily have to be part of the access point. It just means that they need to be recorded as an element in the RDA record if known. There are a few other elements that are core if needed to distinguish one person from another. These same RDA elements translate into MARC in this way. There is no discrete field in current MARC for recording the preferred name. The only place to record it is as a part of the authorized access point in 100. Subfields A and C, not present in, C is not present in this example, contains the preferred name prescribed by RDA. Note that 1900-1949 is not a part of the preferred name, but a cataloger addition to the access point. Similarly, similarly there is no discrete place for, to record the variant name. Until Mark expands to allow this, it has to be recorded as part of a variant access point in subfields A or C of a 4XX field. So you can see in the Marsh John Robert Misses example, that is the variant name. There is also no discrete place to record the fuller form of name element. Until Mark expands to include this element, it is recorded in subfield Q of the access point fields, which are 1XX, 4XX, or 5XX. The date sub-elements are recorded in field 046. Subfield F is date of birth, subfield G is date of death. Note the MARC formatting is different from the formatting called for in RDA. MARC call, calls for a format that goes four digits for the year, two digits for the month, and two digits for the day. Place elements associated with the person are recorded in 370. Subfield A is place of birth. 375 contains the gender element. It is recorded in MARC exactly as RDA calls for it. The language of the person is element is recorded in 377. In current MARC practice, languages are recorded as the MARC language code in subfield A, which is repeatable if the person used more than one language. To complete this record, we would include notes for the sources we consulted to find the information. RDA instructions for this are in Chapter 8. For the most part, they would be recorded in 670 fields, just as NACO practice has been until now. Now let's create a record for a work. The attributes or elements of the work entity are found in RDA Chapter 6, Identifying Works and Expressions. Elements or attributes of work include title, form, date of the work, that is, date the work was created, other distinguishing characteristic, and special guidelines for particular kinds of works like musical works. There are more elements and sub-elements defining work in RDA than there were for person, so I can't put them all on the screen, but these are enough to get us started. Let's create a record for Gone with the Wind using some of these elements. One thing to note before we start, though, author or creator, you will notice, is not an attribute of work in RDA or Ferber. The author is a person, family, or corporate body, and as such is a separate entity with a relationship to the work. In a pure RDA work record, the author's name would not appear in the record, but the record instead would be linked to the record for the author. This is a dramatic difference from current MARC practice. So let's look at the work Gone with the Wind. The title of the work element in RDA is subdivided into sub-elements. These are preferred title for the work and variant title for the work. The preferred title is chosen as you would expect. Choose the title by which the work is commonly known. I am not aware of any variant titles for this particular work, so this element isn't recorded. Gone with the Wind does have a form. It is a novel. We are instructed in RDA to record the date of the work, defined as the earliest date associated with the work. If we don't know the complete history of the work, which we usually won't, we can record the date 
the first expression of the first expression of the work. And this date, in turn, may be the first time the expression was published in a manifestation. In this case, that would be 1936. History of the work is another, another possible element, as is summarization of the work, which comes from RDA Chapter 7. These are all things that describe this work. As it currently exists, Mark has a hard time accommodating a pure RDA work record because the preferred and variant title elements do not have discrete Mark fields, just as we noted that preferred and variant personal name elements do not, and therefore are only recorded in a work record as part of the authorized access point in a 1XX or a 4XX. In this hypothetical example, I'm going to code the preferred title in 190. I've just made that up. Some of the other elements are defined only for the bibliographic format. For example, the summary is uh, given in the 520 field of a bibliographic record. I'm going to make up a 320 field for summary in this hypothetical example. As currently designed, Mark does not work well, but with some tweaking it could work to uh, record RDA work records or descriptions. As with the person entity, associated dates are recorded in 046. Subfield K is the date the work was created. Form of work is recorded in the 380 field. The history of the, of the work element is not mapped in the RDA mappings, which you can find in the RDA toolkit, but it seems to me that it does fit within the definition of Mark 678 authorities format, so I have used that to record it in this example. The point of all this is that it might be possible to reshape MARC to allow it to contain RDA data and also reside in an entity relationship database. Please note that all of these elements describe the work. If we were cataloging in an entity relationship environment, we would only have to record this information one time. For example, we currently record the summary in each and every bibliographic record for this work, at least if we want to be consistent. In an entity relationship environment, we would only need to record it once in the work record. This is what the work gone record for Gone with the Wind might look like under the current MARC field capabilities and the policies during the RDA national test. Preferred title is recorded in subfield T of the 1XX field as a part of the authorized access point because there is no discrete place to record that element in the MARC authorities format. There is no place to record the summary in the Mark Authorities format, so for the moment it will continue to be recorded redundantly in every bibliographic record for this work. Form is recorded in 380. History of the work presumably could be recorded in 678. I don't believe 678 has yet appeared in any work record, but this is how it might look. And here's how these Mark records might fit into, into an entity relationship database based on Ferber. The work entity description is linked to the person entity description by a created by relationship. So how does all this help our users? After all, that's the main point of what we're up to. Ferber and FRAD define tasks that the user wants to accomplish when he or she approaches the library's database. For Ferber, these are, the user needs to find materials relevant to his or her needs. We all know that users don't come to the database, to the library's catalog or other database just to play around in the database. They actually want to find something. A user begins this process by doing a search in the database. Once the search is executed, users need to identify the resource. That is, they must confirm that the resource corresponds to what they were looking for. If more than one resource corresponds to the search, they then need to select the resource most appropriate to their needs. Finally, once the user has selected a resource he or she wants to obtain, uh, they want to get it, they want to obtain it. So that's the fourth user task. FRAD adds the following tasks. First, contextualize. This means that the user needs to be able to place the entity he or she is seeing into context. 
This was apparently meant to apply mainly to creators and users of authority data, but it seems to me to be a useful task to keep in mind for all of our users. The last task, justify, means to document one's reasons for choosing a name or term on which a controlled access point is based. This task is probably only undertaken by creators of authority data, but other users might be, uh, find, find that, uh, that sort of information useful. So, we can partially judge Ferber and RDA by how well they promote these user tasks. Hopefully, by moving to an entity relationship database structure, we will, we will be making it easier for our users, which include ourselves, to do this. Let's see how an entity relationship database might behave. Let's suppose a user approaches the database looking for the name Margaret Mitchell. Since there are more than one, he or she might be given a list of names to choose from. There might be better ways to disambiguate these persons' names, but at the moment we are using dates in library practice, so let's go with them. The user chooses Margaret Mitchell, Margaret Munnerlin, 1900 to 1949. The user might now find his or her way to the person record for Margaret Mitchell which could be open to re reveal the details about Margaret Mitchell that we recorded in the earlier slide. In this way, the user is identifying the person, one of the Ferber user tasks, confirming that this particular Margaret Mitchell is the right one. The display might also show related entities as here. Relationships with other entities um, are another very good way to identify and perhaps they're better than opening up the record and reading about Margaret Mitchell. The user would likely say, oh yes, the Margaret Mitchell who wrote Gone with the Wind is the one that I want. Seeing this display, the user might say, hmm, love story behind Gone with the Wind, that looks interesting. Clicking on that work record might lead to a display such as this. From here, the user could contextualize. That is, they would figure out that the author of this work is Marianne Walker, and it has other subjects aside from Margaret Mitchell. And the user could choose between English, Russian, or Japanese expressions. Or he or she could decide this isn't really what was wanted at all, and go back to Margaret Mitchell. So the user decides to read Gone with the Wind. Note that all entities in the database are related to the, the work Gone with the Wind that are related to the work Gone with the Wind are clearly shown. This includes related persons, works, subjects, and expressions. This contrasts with the current environment where the results of a search usually appear in a jumbled display with little showing how results are related to each other. Here, the user can choose any of the entities and follow the web to other related entities. In this case, let's assume the the user decides that he wants to read an, or to listen to an audio expression. Note that in this simplified diagram there is only one audio expression. In reality, there would be a separate expression description for each performance. Also in this and following slides, for the sake of space, I've included attributes and relationships of certain entities right in the box, which differs from normal diagramming. This expression is the one read by Linda Stevens, as the user can see by seeing this relationship between the expression and the person who performed it. It exists in at least three manifestations or publications. Reviewing the Ferber user task, the user has found and identified a resource. Now he must select the one that meets his needs. Looking at the choices, he realizes that he has neither a cassette player nor a CD player. So he selects the playaway version. The user discovers that a copy is conveniently available, so he goes to the media center and obtains the playaway version of his Gone with the Wind audiobook. There are surely better ways to display this information, but the point of all this is simply to show how a user might navigate through an entity relationship database. So why is an entity relationship structure useful? The first point uh, has to do with the cataloger. 
it's good for the cataloger because the cataloger only needs to record attributes for an entity once rather than multiple times as in current, the current MARC environment. Many catalogers look at this and they think, oh my goodness, I have to see, I have to, I'm going to have to create multiple records for this thing where I now only have to create one record, one bibliographic record. And that, that is true at the beginning of creating a database. But as uh, the database grows, more and more catalogers will be able to reuse records already made for works, expressions, manifestations, items, persons, corporate bodies, and other entities. The second point is it is good for the user because of the ease of nav navigation and the ability to um, contextualize what's going on much more much better than in our normal our displays that we have now. Sometimes people have been referring to this as verbalization. I think that um, refers more to the process of tur turning mark records into entity relationship records if possible. Finally, every piece of the Ferber study was based on the perceived user needs to find, identify, select, and obtain library materials. RDA following Ferber also claims to be designed with the user in mind. It will be up to us in the coming months and years as we become familiar with RDA and begin to use it to decide whether it lives up to this promise and where it doesn't to contribute to inf improving it. Thank you for coming and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions now. Hello, um, this is Kristen Martin again. The first question that we have is, what is the purpose of recording attributes of FRAD entities that aren't used to distinguish one from another? Um, the FRAD entities, I'm not quite sure I understand the, the question. Um, the FRAD entities are, um, are actually related to the Ferber entities. They are, they're pretty much the same entities. There are, there are some more besides the one I've mentioned, ones I've mentioned. It's a little more complicated uh, scenario than the, the Ferber scenario, but not all, um, attributes are always going to necessarily be used to distinguish in the sense of the way we think of for, uh, for access points. Um, they're, most of these entities are simply used to describe, uh, the, the attributes are used to describe entities. Um, I've thought of future cataloging, may, maybe being describing, cataloging all sorts of things. We're not cataloging books necessarily anymore, but we're now cataloging persons and corporate bodies. And part of what we do when we catalog it is to describe them. And part of that description does um, include distinguishing the entity, the instance of an entity from another instance of the entity. Um, we also have a question here. You mentioned several times that Mark does not define specific RDA elements. Do you, you know um, when this might change? Um, it's changing right now. Um, there are MARBI um, proposals for further expansion of Mark to um, to accommodate more RDA elements, which are going to be discussed at this coming midwinter meeting at ALA. Um, a, a whole panoply of changes were made in the last year to mark to accommodate much of RDA. Um, I, uh, I'm simply pointing out that they haven't gotten all the way yet. So it's, it's changing little by little, and we're getting there. Um, do you have any examples that you can share of where people could see a Ferber catalog? Um, I, uh, the, um, I, I am not very good on that. I mean, I, the, I know that there are some examples and they've been discussed on the RDA and the Ferber list. Um, I know that the, um, the VTLS company is um, a company that um, is trying to base its, um, its uh, library system on Ferber. So, so I, it, you could go and look at some of their demonstrations to see how their system works. Um, I don't have any, very many good specifics for, for good Ferber catalogs, though. Um, we do have a, one suggestion from a user for Auslit, too, that people may want oh, to check right. out. That was the one I was trying to think of, but couldn't think of the name. Auslit, Auslit is that what it's called? It's, the Australia, it's an Australian um, database which uh, does literature. I don't have the specifics for how to get to it, but perhaps we could email that out if somebody could send us the information. Um, and then going back to our um, initial question, some follow-up on that. 
I, I think, why would you need to record a person's gender if it's not needed to distinguish from another person? Um, you don't need to record it. I mean, it's, it's, um, that is not one of the core elements in RDA. Um, it's certainly uh, optionally available, even if it's not needed to distinguish one person from another. Um, I can see lots of uses for a lot of these elements. For example, in the case of the gender, um, I can many I can certainly see um, a need for uh, being able to sort the database by gender. For instance, if a person wants to do a study of, I don't know, female um, composers from Australia, if we've put all that information into the authority records, um, the place information and the gender information, we can certainly sort out and, and um, get those get those into this, into a group so that people can can um, sort things that way if they want to. But your, the the, question, the person who asked the question is quite right. That if it's not needed, it's not required to, to record it in RDA. So um, let's, let me just use this opportunity to say all of these things, all of these attributes do not have to be in every single record. Um, in, in an RDA catalog, only the core attributes need to be in every single record. Um, and so, for instance, with person, that includes the name of the person. Um, date of the person has been uh, um, made a core in RDA, and I, have, I interpret that to mean that if you know it, you must record it. That doesn't mean you have to put it in the, um, in the access point. It means you have to record it in the record somewhere. But not all of the attributes are core, and so they're not all required. And so we, don't have, we are not going to have to go out and do research to find out all this information um, just to record it as one of the attributes. Okay, um, we have a question about, um, have Ferber and RDA been coordinated with museums and archives? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I know that there has been um, certainly communication with the, between all the communities. One of the points of RDA was to reach out to other communities, so I know, I know that we have had um, communication with the other communities, including probably museums and archives. I don't know the details about that. Perhaps one of our listeners does and can send that in. Um, and an additional question, what do you mean by a pure work record? Um, I mean, a, I meant a record that only records the attributes that are um, required for a, a work um, description in RDA. So um, when I said a pure work record, I would, I would see a pure work record in a Ferber RDA-based database would not, for instance, include the name of the person. That would in, instead be in a... Um, the person who created it. That would be instead be in a um, in a separate record linked by a uh, by a by a relationship link. Um, the work rec one of the attributes of work is not the name of the person who created it, but our um, current work records in Mark do include that in the one XX fields. Um, um, that's I, I suppose that's how we're currently linking things. But um, I'm thinking in the future that that may may not be part of the record. Um, and how do we visualize or know that a Ferber system will be better than MARC for information retrieval? Um, I think we could, well, I mean, I, I am personally convinced just by my little um, diagrams that I've made for myself over the last couple of years um, that it will be easier to navigate. Um, this is more and more how people are becoming used to navigating through the, the internet, which is called, which we refer to as the World Wide Web. That's what a, a web is, is a, is a set of records that are linked by relationship links. Um, I, uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought here. Let's see, can you say the question again? I've lost my tra track of where we were. Um, the question is, uh, how do we visualize or know that the Ferber system will be better than marked for information retrieval? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I think um, there are lots of things we can say about that. I mean, there will be less repetition um, of information from one record to the other, and so less possibility for mistakes. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I just think it will, I, I don't have an answer to that because we haven't actually been able to test it very well. Um, by, uh, but I think most people are um, liking to move towards that sort of a, sort of a database structure now. Uh, we can uh, compare with other databases. Um, many uh, database structure in, in many parts of the, wor uh, of the 
the database world, um, our entity relationship, for instance, any genealogical database is an entity relationship database, and they're quite easy to navigate through, um, probably easier than our MARC databases are, which are based on what we call flat file records. Um, so I, there's no way to prove it right at this point, I don't think, but I think we can compare with other types of databases and look at other things. Okay. Um, strict and loose translations are considered different works. What guidelines can a cataloger follow to determine if a translation is loose enough to be considered a new work? Um, that's completely up to the judgment of the cataloger. Um, we just had an example of that just yesterday here at BYU. A cataloger came to me and asked, um, this is a, uh, an abridgment of, a, of another work. Is it the same work or is it a different work? And, and that's always going to be a judgment call. I mean, you have to just decide, is it, is it far enough away from the original work that it's a completely new work or not? Um, Translations are interesting because translations, we in our culture have always considered them to be the same work as the original, and yet every single word in that translation is different from the original, and it's completely different from the original uh, text, and yet we consider them to be the same work. This is always a cultural question. It's completely a judgment question, um, and some cultures might um, consider some things to be the same work that other cultures would not. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have very good advice for this, but I, I think you need to just use your judgment. And it's, this is not a change from RDA, AACR to, RD, to, to RDA. The same question needed to be decided in our AACR 2 as well. Um, and do you anticipate that these Berber databases will have other uses besides bibliographic? I'm sure they will. Um, I mean, I well, actually, I, I mean, I... Uh, the Ferber databases are, going, are being designed as bibliographic databases. I think people could certainly come in and use them for other things. Um, there's always the, um, the argument in the authorities world about whether we need to add extra things to the headings um, because all, I mean, there, there's a the great divide between the people who think that they only need, we only need to have enough in the, the heading to to distinguish from other persons, for instance, with their person records, and there are others who think, well, people use this as a reference, so it's useful to them to have dates on them, for instance. So people do come into our databases for other reasons than to find materials. Um, and so I would think if we um, wind up building up this uh, database with many more attributes than we may be used to adding into, let's say, person records, for instance, people may come to these records for other reasons besides finding materials for finding resources. They may come in for reasons like they want to know a little more about Margaret Mitchell and they know this is a good place to come look for it. So certainly our databases could be used for other things besides bibliographic um, reasons, but their primary purpose is to be a bibliographic database and so that's what we need to be thinking about and that's always what we need to think about when we're cataloging is why we're doing things. and and. Uh, sort of resist the temptation, of course, to go overboard uh, with, with the details that we add to these records. Um, do you anticipate that the relationship themselves will be searchable or available as options for sorting in RDA Ferber-based catalogs? I certainly hope they would. I think um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the uh, decisions that was made in Ferber was not to assign attributes to relationships, but in, in entity relationship the, um, database structure, Relationships also can have attributes. So if, uh, for instance, um, Ferber and RDA had decided to, re to um, assign a date attribute to a creator relationship, for instance, or a public, maybe a um, producer relationship between a publisher, publisher and a, um, a manifestation, um, let's say that was that were the case, then a user, if you could search the relationships, could say, well, you know what, I'm really interested in publications the publication patterns from the 1930s, I would like to see all um, publications um, that have the relationship and all manifestations that are related to a publisher that were um, created in 1930. Um, so I think, I, I hope, I certainly hope that our databases will allow us to search the relationships as well. I think that would be very useful, yes. Um. Um, so, so I mean, I, I'm just thinking my own, our own uh, library database at BYU, um, our special collections has a um, has an emphasis on history of printing, and we do we have been forever, even in ACR2, putting on relationship uh, designators to 
the printers so that um, a person can go through and find a list of all the printers that are available at BYU in our, in our special collections, in our early printing collection. Um, that's a relationship search. And so I would hope in a, in a, in a, a relationship uh, database, one could go in and say, all right, I want to find all the printer relationships in these between this you know between 1500 and 1600 I want to see what the library has and that would be a relationship search so yes I do hope that in our future databases we will be able to search not only the entities but the relationships as well okay um, do you see creating a pure work record to consist to a large extent of entering codes to, re to refer to different entity records um, there are different ways it could be done, and that's certainly one way. Our RDA takes, in, takes into account different ways to do uh, to, to make relationship links, um, and one of the ways is to use identifiers, which are, as I understand it, are codes that would just simply link records. I would hope that um, that catalogers, though, in the future, don't have to type in codes and things, but that instead we can have a database where we can sort of graphically see things and just make links by maybe moving things to one another and, and, and sort of merging them on, the, on our screen without having to worry about how the system itself is putting in the codes to link. Um, I, I'm sure that the codes will be in the background, but I hope that we catalogers don't have to input them ourselves. Okay. Um, we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to ask you one more question, and then there will be a list of questions that uh, we'll get from here, so questions that we haven't got to, you know, hopefully Bob will be able to answer. But the last question I'd like to ask is the current flat file mark record, which contains the elements related to work, expression, manifestation, and item in one, still provides a convenient vessel for the sharing of bibliographic records. How do you think the more complex entity relationship model will impact the practice of copy cataloging? Um, I have thought about this, and I think, I think um, we could have a similar structure in the future um, as we do now. I, w I, I could see a system where, I mean, again, I, I want to I see us, I'd like to see a system where catalogers don't have to explicitly make links necessarily. And so let us say we have an entity relationship database and we are copy cataloging from it. And I go in and I say, all right, I have a 2010 publication of Gone with the Wind here. Let me just go see if there's a manifestation record for that. And I go into that database and by golly, there is a manifestation record. I bring that into my database, and ideally, it would drag with it all of the related records that are needed. Um, and presumably, if they're already in our in our database, they don't need to be put in again. They could be um, it could be either merged or something. Um, so I, I would hope that um, this would actually make things simpler for copy catalogers that they wouldn't have to be looking through the whole record, they would just have to find the piece that they need. Um, many people have looked to the future and said, well, maybe there won't be any local databases at all, where, so we'll just be in sort of a database in the cloud. I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that, but if, but if so, in that sort of a case, a copy cataloger would go in and say, all right, I'm finding the manifestation record for Gone with the Wind. I need now to add an item record for my copy, um, which would be linked to perhaps my library as an owner with that relationship. Um, so I, I mean I see I see it as being making things actually easier for copy cataloging. Um, it does appear at first glance to be quite complex, but um, I think if we were really into this, we would we would find it to be easier once the database gets itself going. I mean the, the building of the database will be complicated at the beginning. All right. Well thank you very much. Um, I am just going to grab the screen back. And I would like to thank you for taking the time to explain Ferber and the relationship between Ferber and RDA. And let everybody know that additional webinars on RDA are being planned for the spring, and information on these webinars will be available shortly on the ELEX website. Uh, we don't have them up yet, but I know there's going to be a series of five webinars on RDA that's planned to begin in February. So you'll be seeing announcements, or please check the website. We hope that you found today's session useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form, so please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and then return the form to us. The comments that are received are reviewed by the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee, and we use them to plan additional continuing education offerings. So additional information, like I said, is available on the ELECT's homepage, and uh, please go there. New webinars and, and continuing education events are continuously being developed, so check the ELECT's homepage frequently for new information. 
We welcome suggestions for webinars and other continuing educational opportunities. You can suggest a webinar topic through the link to the ELEX website that's on the screen. And finally, before we sign off, I would like to thank Geneva Chambly for providing technical support for today's webinar. She and her colleagues on the Continuing Education Committee's technical support subcommittee make it possible to present these webinars smoothly. We sincerely appreciate your attendance today and hope that you will join us again for future webinars on RDA and all other topics. Goodbye. <laughs>